Well, welcome to uh, day two. Everybody have a good evening? Wide awake? Ready for more content? All right, good. Um, and just in terms of reviewing our day two agenda, we've got a couple uh, updates here on the product. We're going to start with demand planning, and then we'll go into the uh, Power BI part of the platform. Uh, v &A and Kelly will be giving you those updates. We're going to take a short break. Then we're going to do an update for our NetSuite platform. Uh, we have a unique code base that runs native in Oracle NetSuite. And we have about 30 or 40 clients on that platform. So we want to share some updates for them because that landscape is changing. Uh, we're going to talk about our integrations uh, team. You should have met uh, Wayne and AJ uh, over the last day. Uh, we've been doing a lot more of this with clients as we've gone through time in the early days. Another client had to manage all that work, but we've started doing that. And there's a lot of creative options that we've got that we can help clients with. And it helps kind of speed up implementations and new functionality when you're uh, adding on that. And then Patrick is going to give us the update on the product roadmap. I'm sure he's been a popular guy. Everybody has ideas about new features and functions. So Patrick will kind of share that wisdom with you. And then uh, after lunch, uh, we're going to have a lighter lunch today. We're going to talk about helping with client support and the capabilities that we have to provide more documentation to help you be more self-sufficient with training, new users come online and all that kind of good stuff. And then uh, Wally and I are going to kind of facilitate a session at the end of, of the day to talk about this idea of how do we improve our supply chain maturity? How do we kind of progress forward? And what are the things that are meaningful for all of you and all of us to help along that path? It's going to be more questions than it is answers. So we'll be woo clapping till the cows come home and uh, trying to get some insights from all of you on that. And then we'll kind of wrap up the session at that point. Okay. All right. So without further ado, I want to hand it over to VNA. She is one of our associates, works out of Mexico and has been involved at Caterpillar and a number of other clients. She's going to share some insights around our demand planning functionality. Let's hear it for VNA. Thank you, Eric. Um, delighted to be your host today. And today we're going to talk about leveraging or demand planning to improve um, your agility and resilience. Um, so excited to show you uh, this new functionality that was introduced to into flow last year and um, how you can use it to improve your agility. So <clears throat> we've been talking uh, several sessions yesterday and during our webinars uh, this year about the VUCA world, right? So VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Um, this is something we live every day in our supply chains. We face a lot of challenges uh, from firefighting, uh, something that Russell mentioned yesterday, to staff issues, uh, disruptions in our ports, uh, a lot of different issues that we are facing. Um, yesterday, during lunch, I was sitting with the Freshmark and the McElroy folks talking about the disruptions they got with the pandemic, right? That's a very... Uh, a straightforward example that everyone can relate to. Uh, so because of that, uh, this slide is also familiar for you. We need to become more agile and resilient. We need to adapt to those conditions and come stronger from, from those. Um, so the definitions, we already know them. Agile is the ability to move with quick, easy grace, and then resilient to recover from difficult conditions. And this is a very important framework on demand planning because the thing is how we, we can use demand planning to recover from these conditions and be able to set up our operating model. Um, so it is true that in order to become agile and resilient, we must embrace the, uncert the certainty of an uncertain future, right? We know the forecast is going to be wrong, um, but what can we do about it? That's the question. This is the demand-driven adaptive enterprise model as presented by the Demand-Driven Institute. Um, if we start looking from the left to the right, we get our operating model. 
we know that if we face our operating model to actual demand, we'll get better results because we are adapting to those changes in our demand and reacting to them, right? When we are moving to uh, the future, um, we definitely need a view of what is going to happen at some level. Uh, and that's where SNOP uh, plays an important role and demand planning also. Um, so the, the demand planning will give us a forecast that will give us a view of what is going to happen. And then we can use that to configure our operating model. Uh, and what I mean by that is we could, from SNOP and demand planning, we could get some adjustments into our operating model, such as buffer profile changes, uh, cycle day adjustment factors, um, things that will help us to operate better. Um, so the demand planning uh, module here will help us to generate a range of forecasts, uh, collaborate across organ organization, and avoid, uh, avoid masking and smoothing demand volatility. And we'll do that through our demand planning process. So the first step will be gather relevant data, such as historical sales. Um, in Interflow, uh, our materials planning module already uses that data. So um, demand planning has um, an integration that runs within Interflow where that data is shared with demand planning. And that's really the baseline for our calculation of the forecast. Um, then uh, the system will generate a forecast baseline, baseline through the forecasting tool. So uh, uh, it uses AI, ML, and other tools to come up with the best model for your specific demand pattern at part level. And once you get that baseline, you can collaborate with others, uh, such as sales or finance, to adjust that accordingly and get better results. And the last step in our demand planning process will be review the forecast uh, KPIs and adjust if needed, okay? So now uh, we'll talk about how this demand planning process fits into, uh, into flow. Um, this is the home screen for demand planning. And basically it's our dashboard or heat map that will tell us what we need to focus on. So, in here on the on the on the left we have volume right so we have three different categories of volume and uh, it's basically doing a pareto to identify the parts that have more impact on revenue cost or profit right so on the top left and then on the left and then at the top we have variation categories so the parts that have more variations will will be more difficult to forecast, of course. So that way, in this um, category, we have six items that we need to focus on where they have the most impact and then also the greatest variation. So if we can focus on those, I uh, will get better results. And again, everything in Interflow is about, about prioritization, right? So you know what to focus on. When we click on that category that we were just talking about, you get the navigator and um, you have views similar to the workbench a little bit. You can set up different views, different filters, accommodate your columns for um, better um, visualization. And in here, you'll get the part numbers details and then the best forecast method that the system came up with for each part. Uh, and something in here. So you have this uh, eye icon that when you click on it, you'll get the detail by part number. Um, for, this, uh, for this item, we are using our Bogler company again as an example. Uh, we get the blue line as the historical demand. We recommend to use at least two years of historical demand to get the best results in our forecast. Uh, that way the forecast can learn the pattern and get better results. Um, so um, I don't know if you can see, but there are two lines. Uh, one is drawing the demand uh, history and the total line is just um, showing the forecast 
uh, for that historical demand. And you can see that they are very close between each other. So the system is coming up with that algorithm that is giving us very close results to the actual demand. And then the red line is the forecast, right? So this is um, starting on week 18, 18 and is giving up, up all these numbers that are drawing into the chart here. Um, something uh, else, um, right now we are showing these in weekly buckets. You could do that also monthly, um, there, there's options there. Um, now, the forecast, forecasting or the demand planning process is really going to be by category or some other um, aggregation. Um, you don't really do demand planning at part level, so uh, you have different um, you have capabilities to aggregate by different fields in into flow. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, 12 uh, available user-defined fields that you can populate and use for aggregation. Uh, in this example, I'm using our material type for the popular company. So we have uh, 12 packs, six packs to leaders, and we're getting the total forecasted demand by week for those categories. Um, so in here is really where we would meet with our sales and finance team and collaborate together, right? And so let's say in here that we are going to have a um, promotional campaign and we know that we are going to have an impact of 400,000 units for week 25, right? Um, oh, sorry about that. There you go. I'm clicking the wrong button. Yeah, so in here, uh, the 400,000 uh, demand, you can adjust it directly here by category. And what this will do is trickle back down to specific items that are within that category, right? So if we come back to the item that we were looking at before, we can see this value got populated automatically from the system from that adjustment that we did at the aggregation level. Um, and when you hover um, the chart here, you'll see that the work, uh, the week 25, is showing the consensus forecast. So it is replacing the number that the system uh, came up with in the collaboration, right? Um, now, the real question here is, What's the real impact of that promotion, right? Um, we won't need to adjust every item, probably, because we may already have inventory, we may have already orders coming to us, um, or maybe it's not even a big deal. Maybe we can deal with that spike in the demand. So here is where SNOP comes in. Um, and we can basically use SNOP to um, test the agility and resilience of our operating model and see if we can address that promotion or what do we need to do, right? Um, there's, when running SNOP, so coming back to the process, we um, were in demand planning, uh, we collaborated, we got an input for the SNOP and then we are going to run it. So um, when running SNOP, we get these different alert uh, categories that we can set up in here. And I'm going to focus on the promotion ones. So what this is telling me is I'm going to get a medium alert whenever I have a weekly demand that is twice the average weekly demand. So that way I can identify the items that are really going to be impacted by this promotion. And same thing, I'm going to get a high alert for three times the weekly demand and five times the weekly demand. Um, and when focusing on exceptions, then it's where I get agility in my system. Um, so the, when the SNOP runs, we get different reports. Um, and I'm going to show the promotion report here. You can see in material type, I'm filtering by six packs to leaders, the, the category that we collaborate on. And on week of June 17, which was our 25 week of the year, we get a total demand of 400,000, right? Which matches with the adjustment that we did in demand planning. And these are really the items that I need to focus on because 
for the first item, I have a peak of demand of three times my average weekly demand, right? So this is the item that gets the most impact. And when we look at the projection, you can see I have a stock out because of that promotion, right? Um, so this is something that we need to address in order to be successful. Um, now, the adjustment that we need to do is we might need to adjust or yellow zone somehow to get these to not stock out, right? So we need to pre-build this uh, finished good. And uh, an option that is also available in SNOP is called intelligent adjustments highlighted here. So what intelligent adjustments will do is look for stockouts and adjust the yellow zone well, or buffer zones uh, one lead time ahead of that event so it can address that variation. Um, when I turn that on and run the um, SNOP again, you can see this big adjustment in, a, in my yellow zone, right? And now I'm not longer stocking out, so I will get, um, when looking also at my projected supply report, I will get um, what do I need to prebuild uh, on what week and how much to address that promotion. Um, from that supply plan, I could even get to um, RCCP, right? So based on my supply plan that would get from these items, I could get um, the load that would take to address this uh, incremental demand. And um, based on my routing, um, I see here on the week of June 17, um, so we are uh, over capacity either way, right? In other weeks in this example, but for the week of June 17, I, I got an impact of online one for, with 142% of load uh, for that resource. Uh, so we can make decisions about it. Um, in here is um, the RCCP tool could also be useful in a uh, a strategic range where maybe you'll need to take decisions on, I need to add a new line, I need to add more staff to my production floor, I need to do something about it. I'm going to stop here and see if anybody has questions at this point. All right. Um, <clears throat> now talking about the demand planning KPIs. Uh, once we get that event, we can come back to um, demand planning and get KPIs and see how we did, right? So um, we have options to go through different uh, periods of time, see how we did against one lead time, two lead times. Uh, we call that blacks, um, and basically get a comparison of the forecast that we had against the real demand in that period. So um, in this uh, image here, we are evaluating six back two liters. And you can see we get uh, measurements for accuracy, error, and bias. And we have different rows. The first row is for into flow. So this is the baseline, the forecast that the system came up with based on AIML and the best forecast method to um, for that specific demand pattern. And it gives us a, a number of accuracy for that baseline. Then we get the user, um, the user percentage. This is our collaboration, right? So in this case, um, we get 69% uh, for the second week here, we have an improvement and um, the value added is the difference between the user forecast and the into flow forecast. So in this example, we um, didn't really good, uh, did a good job, right? The system was uh, aligned to, um, uh, the system gave us a better forecast than what we did. And um, I guess the message here that I want to share is we don't need to focus on make our forecast better, uh, uh, for, make our forecast perfect. We need to spend the right amount of time looking through our demand planning, trying to get the best view that we could get, um, the closest to uh, get a better, a good view of the forecast that 
will let us know what the future is going to be, but without overthinking or overspending time there. Because again, as we know, the forecast will always be wrong, right? Um, and then we get those same columns for the accuracy, for the error, and the, for the bias. So um, this is something also available in our demand planning that we would expect to be part of our demand planning process. Um, so to improve your agility and resilience through this demand planning process, uh, we would go through these different steps that we have talked about today. First, um, we would use demand planning to get our forecast. Uh, uh, the forecast should be a good enough representation of the future. So we can make decisions. And using our SNOP tool, use the forecast to test the agility and resilience of our operating model, um, and then adjust accordingly, right? Um, the system will provide different reports. Um, you can even, uh, again, get supply, uh, supply plans for uh, your manufacturer items and projections for your buy items um, to get these into a better place. Um, are there any any questions for for me today? Questions. There's a question. Yes, Russell. I'm new to I'm new to the SNOP part of it. The how do you add resources and resource constraints to the system? You just you import them into the system and they're there. So you can put in all your resources. The same that definitions that we use for the scheduling engine are used for the RCCP functionality. You can change that resource, like in the example back. To this one, if yeah. you have that overload, you can toggle that resource then to be a constraint and it will finitely schedule. And it'll pull that pre build earlier. See, the prior week had excess capacity to level load that. So we do it first on the material planning side, make sure you can adjust for that um, promotional event. And then it's tested against the RCCP to figure out how much earlier uh, you need to pull that report. Okay. But there's a couple different options for, because adaptive, we're not an APO. Right. And yeah. you know, at Unilever, we didn't use right. APO to, through an API or anything like that. We just had our a non-constraint plan yep. that thankfully we had capacity for. Yeah. As long as you have your resources defined and your shift calendars defined and your run rates and your routings are and setups are accurate or reasonably accurate, you're going to get very good idea of what the loading is going to be. But it can be just a, a, a one-time upload of what the resource constraint yeah. is. Yeah, you don't update. the. That's typically pretty static data. Okay. So you're not having to change that on the fly all the time. Yeah. Yeah, the shifts the shift would absolutely be one of the options to address that. What your shift calendars are, and you can put shift calendar exceptions in for periods of time. This can be both for a promotional event or a line shutdown, where you're going to do PM for a week or something like that, and you need to pre-build stock ahead of that shutdown so that you can cover market demand while you're out of operations. Okay. A resource level and on a resource base. Yeah, if you have parts of the plant that are running twenty four seven, reflect them that way. Others may be running only eight hours a day, so you have got quite a range of flexibility in how you set up the resources for the RCCP. Um, yes, Philip. Sure. Yeah, that's the normal input into the uh, SNOP module today. And you can drive forecasted daily usages off of that. It'll cascade down through the bill of material to subcomponents and bought in materials. So very good alignment of that demand signal into the system that way. And on that topic, we are um, making an improvement here where today we summarize all the demand for the day but we lose vi visibility to the granularity of the demand underneath that. So companies, especially in the consumer goods arena, will wanna forecast by sales channel 
or by customer even, right? You know, we've got this much business with Walmart. Here's what their forecast is. There's a demand planner who's assigned to work with them and massage that schedule or that forecast. So that feature is coming, Danny, or is Danny, Patrick? Soon. Soon. <laughs> I think by June or June, July timeframe. So the ability to change your forecast or rather your demand history down to that granular level expands the amount of data, but it gives you the ability to cut through the forecast in various different dimensions now that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And we're adding, I think, 10 UDF fields for that demand history. So you can attribute it by sales channel, by customer, by territory, by whatever, you know, uh, which will give you a lot more ability to really drive that demand planning down to the appropriate dimension. Okay. Any other questions on demand planning? All right, V&A, well done, thanks. Thank you.